Welcome to a new edition of Inside Boxing Daily. I'm your host for tonight, Jeremiah Pricer, and with me is a guest who's been a regular on the show. Every, I want to welcome in Hamid. How you doing, man? It's good to be back. Now, a pretty quick turnaround time, but anyways, uh, it, it, again, I'm, I'm bad because, you know, Mike is always good with this stuff. He does it a lot more than I do, but as always, we are brought to you by betnow.eu. If you want to do some some boxing betting, go to the banner on the page, click it, and we get a little back for that. Use the code TRUTH50 as well. Uh, we're brought to you by Seat Giant. If you want to buy some boxing tickets, click on the banner. Get a little kickback from that. And also the Retired Boxers Foundation with Jackie Richardson and Alex Ramos. Ramos is a damn good dude. He's got a movie coming out about his life as he's tried to separate himself from a serial rapist who has the same name. Anyways, uh, we're going we're gonna to start with the, the wonderful YouTube card. Uh, I know a lot of people are saying a lot of positive things about it. Uh, I mean, you know, the main event was, was I think, a slam dunk for fight of the year. Uh, it, it was just fantastic. I mean, top to bottom, they just really did a good, good job. Uh, no, I'm just, I'm just fucking around. But anyways, we'll, we'll, start with the, we'll start with the Billy Joe Saunders. Uh, Mar, Mar, I can't even say the last name, so I'm not even going to try. And again, this will probably be the last time I mention him anyways. Uh, he, was, he wasn't ranked at 160. Uh, I don't think he had ever fought at 168, if I'm not mistaken. I remember combing over his record and not seeing a whole lot there. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, Billy Joe had a tough time with him, uh, much tougher than a lot of people expected. Uh, Saunders, this represents the first defense of one of his alphabet trinkets or the only alphabet trinket that he holds. Uh, I thought it was a pretty poor performance. Um, but I think as you know, quite well, Billy Joe Saunders has the ability, well, the knack to fight on his opponent's level. Yeah, I, I think so too. And again, if Canelo wants to, because uh, again, I think we both realize that Canelo is probably not going to want to boil all the way back down to 160. Uh, I've heard a number of things in discussion already. And of course, it's, it's just rumors at the moment, but any one of these names has some legitimacy. Uh, you know, Billy Joe Saunders, I think would be an interesting fight, of course. Uh, I would like to see it at 168. Uh, I'd prefer to see it at 160, to be honest with you, because Billy Joe looks... A, he looks as if he's significantly better at 160, and you wouldn't think eight pounds should make that big a difference, but he just looks a bit flabby at 160. 
or 168, he's not as sharp. He's not as quick. I mean, his game suffers because of the weight gain. Uh, but I think, you know, Billy Joe Saunders is a, a live opponent. Uh, I think, you, you know, David Lemieux, and that fight was talked about years ago uh, when David Lemieux, I, I don't know if he still is, but I think Lemieux at one point was either under the Golden Boy promotional banner or he was they had some rights to him kind of like top ranked did with Jeff Horn I, I don't I don't know exactly but that that fight was thrown around years back and I wouldn't be surprised by that either because uh you, you know it, it it feels like Canelo Alvarez could get a softer touch in and a lot of people wouldn't complain about it because you know say what you want about Canelo Alvarez his schedule has been pretty stiff lately you know the with the two Golovkin fights Daniel Jacobs uh, Kovalev you know whatever shape you peg him to be he was still a top five light heavyweight so his schedule has been pretty tough so I wouldn't be surprised if he takes a David Lemieux around Cinco de Mayo next year, and then you know they look forward to other things, what you know, it's just kind of hard to look into the crystal ball and see exactly what is in his future. Uh, I don't think a Golovkin fight. I don't think a third fight would be. I, I don't think that's plausible for Cinco de Mayo. I think if they wanted it, and I know DeZone really wants it because. It, it, it generates more subscribers. It generates more revenues, the revenue than just about any fight in boxing. And so, you know, September is really the date that seems as if it would be targeted for something like that. But, you know, whether it's Billy Joe or David Lemieux, I probably wouldn't complain too hard, especially because Billy Joe is a damn good fighter, even if he has fought to the level of his opposition. Lemieux is a big puncher. He probably doesn't have much of a shot against Canelo, who's... I think much too savvy to get hit with one of those bombs. But again, Lemieux is a, he is a good fighter. I mean, he's been ranked at middleweight for a long time. As you noted before, he's had some weight issues. So I was under the impression that David Lemieux was, was going to 168. Actually, I thought he was going to go a few years back. Uh, I think he was, again, maybe I'm mistaken here and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he was hospitalized last time he tried to make weight because it was so tough for him. So again, I think it makes sense that one of those one of those two guys could be his opposition because he's not going to boil down to 160. Either way, it doesn't matter. It wasn't a good performance. He did get the stoppage, and he was actually losing on one of the uh, one of the judges' scorecards. I believe it was. Um, I think he was down by two two rounds, if I'm not mistaken. And Billy Joe in the interview said that that performance was not worthy of a Golovkin or a Canelo Alvarez. So he was honest with himself. Uh, hopefully he recognizes it and he stays in the gym, stays sharp. Uh, because personally, I think that's one of his issues. I think he's sat on his hands a little too long. He's He's not as active as I would like to see a top-level guy be, and especially against that level of opposition. right yeah Yeah.
Yeah, I uh, yeah, I think the closest thing that he's had is uh, Willie Monroe. Uh, Willie Monroe Jr. I mean, Monroe Jr. is he's a good fighter, but he's not, you know, he's not top brass. He's not a an elite level operator. And, you know, that fight was it was fairly it was competitive, but it wasn't one of those fights that, uh, you know, you look at and you're going to you're not going to go rewatch it. That's for sure. But I. Yeah, well, and I'm with you. I mean, I would much rather see Billy Joe Saunders than David Lemieux as well. Uh, it, it, I, I do want to put that out there because I, I do. I would much rather see that, but at the same time, I, I have to acknowledge the way boxing is, and even Canelo Alvarez gets the easier ones from time to time. I mean, look at the you know the Chavez Jr. fight. That was nothing but a one-sided thrashing for 12 rounds. Uh, again, when you're fighting at this level, especially when you're somebody like Canelo Alvarez, and even you know Golovkin and, and pretty much anybody who's operating on that level, I'd like to see fight at least three times a year. But I'm just trying to acknowledge the reality of the situation, and you'd never know. I mean, Canelo has had some easier ones. Fielding was was pretty much a soft touch. Uh, Chavez Jr. was a soft touch. So I wouldn't be surprised after a year like he's had to have somebody like David Lemieux and then maybe one fight after that. Uh, again, it's an unfortunate aspect of modern boxing, but a lot of these guys are only fighting two times a year. Uh, I know Canelo squeezed in a third fight. What was it, last year when he fought Rocky Fielding? Yeah, but I, I'm just I'm, I'm not sure that's common. I mean, it seems like he's typically fighting two years. Anyways, I don't want to see the Lemieux fight. I just... I'm not putting it outside the realm of possibility just because it's been talked about in the past. It's, it's kind of like the, uh, the Golovkin, uh, Sarah's meta fight. Uh, have you heard about that one? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, sure. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, and, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with most fans is that it's not going to be a fight that a lot of us are going to be looking forward to, but it's just, again, it's just modern boxing. You can't expect these guys. Unfortunately, I, I actually think if you're only fighting two times a year, both of your fights should be tough ones. I, I know some people disagree, and uh, but I just think when you're only doing it two times, I, I think they've got to be big matches. Anyways, I don't know if you saw the Devin Haney versus Santiago fight. I'll give you a quick assessment of that one. And it was like the Billy Joe Sander Saunders fight in a way where Devin Haney had more trouble than was expected. Not quite in the same manner, however. Uh, Sant Santiago was pretty much getting beat every round. I think there was one or two rounds where maybe you could have said he took it, but uh, maybe just one. I, I, I can't remember... Uh, I can't remember many of them clearly, to be honest with you. I mean, it was pretty one-sided, but Santiago, he he was pretty crafty. He had a bit – actually, it reminded me of the Teofimo Lopez. Um, uh, who's the, the Japanese fellow that he fought? Na, Naku – yes – Yes, yeah, it kind of reminded me of that in a way where, you know, these guys were young. They they had a little trouble with, uh, you know, some tall guys. Haney was very good. He did score a knockdown, uh, but he didn't really light it up. You could see that, you know, there's still a learning curve there. And it's going to be a little while before he's ready for the best of the best, especially, I think, like somebody like Lamachenko. But you don't know. It's always hard to tell how quickly these guys will learn, how quickly they'll adapt. Haney looks like a damn good fighter. He looks like he's going to be a damn good fighter in the, in the future. Uh, again, I don't know if you saw this fight, but it was pretty much a shutout, but a little bit tougher than Haney expected.
Well, he he already has something uh, lined up, if if uh, that surprises you. But apparently, he's going to be fighting Javier Fortuna next. <clears throat> yeah, for, yeah. For the time being, I agree. Yeah, I, I don't think you're selling a, a lot of fans who were on the fence or who had just recently been exposed to box. I mean, if you were watching it for the KSI Logan Paul event and you were watching that and you're like, these guys are world champions. And again, it's not to undercut what Devin Haney or even Billy Joe Saunders had done. But it just, you know, you look at those and you're like, well, this is a world championship fight. I mean, uh, you, you just, I think if you are a layman and you, you have a lack of boxing knowledge and you hear the term world champion or a championship fight and you watch something like that, I, I just don't think, I don't think the card as a whole is going to convert, um, as some of these people were hoping, a lot of people to becoming hardcore boxing fans. I mean, I've heard that the numbers for KSI and Logan Paul were huge. And again, that's fine. And maybe you'll get some converts out of that. It's possible. Uh, but I just don't think the exposure was anything like they wanted to be. I, I'm sure that they expected fairly quick knockouts from Billy Joe Saunders and Devin Haney. And what they got was, uh, you know, a pretty boring decision on Haney's parts and a, you know, late stoppage on Billy Joe Saunders' part. But I, it, it was worse than that, however. It was worse. I don't think you said that you had caught the fight before the main event because Haney was Haney and Saunders, they were not before the – they weren't right – one of those fights was not right before the main event. Actually, they had some uh, – I forget what the kid's name was, Ali Bobby or something like that. I, I honestly can't remember because I turned it off. Um, I don't really really tuned in for the ha- – <clears throat> Uh, I, I honestly don't know. I didn't know who these guys were. Uh, it was a, a white guy with a good record versus a, what was it, a Colombian with a board a, about 500 record. And the fight ended in a, a, a ridiculous disqualification. Uh, the Colombian, I, I believe he was from Colombia. I'm probably messing that up, but I don't really care because, again, this guy's of, of no note. But, uh, yeah, he just he, he, he faked it. And, yeah, it was, it was just a bad look. Yeah. Yeah, you're right.
Yeah, I don't think we're going to get much of that. And to be honest with you, I, I didn't watch the main event. Uh, well, I actually did watch rounds four through six because Mike called me and he was like, "Hey, dude, check this out." And I, when, when I turned it when I turned it on, Logan Paul, it was I think it was the fourth round when Logan Paul actually landed a nice right uppercut and scored a knockdown. And then I I thought Jack Reese blew the entire thing. Uh, with with his uh, you know two point deduction and whatnot, but uh, I mean it, it it appeared to me that KSI was a bit like a really like dumbed down version of Deontay Wilder. He was he was he was wild swinging. He actually looked like he had some pop in his in his hands. Right, it, he didn't look like he was a pillow puncher, uh, but he just lacked. He lacked skill. I mean, Logan Paul was sticking behind the jab. His technique was tighter, uh, but he just didn't seem like he wanted to mix it up. And uh, I mean, I think even Michael Montero said this, and he was spot on, is that Logan Paul, if he would have just thrown the damn right hand, I think he could have knocked the guy out. But even after he had KSI hurt, uh, and I blame Jack Reese a little bit for this, for dragging it out, you know, when... To me, if you if you see that a guy's hurt, I mean, you kind of want to get them back into the fray as quickly as possible. But uh, yeah, I, I just don't know why Logan Paul didn't jump on him and, and knock him out. And it, go go ahead. Yeah, I agree. And, and again, I, I don't want to analyze this too deeply because, again, I, I missed uh, pretty much half the fight or most of the fight. And, uh, again, I, I'm just going off what I saw. Again, I just I, – to me, it looked like the uppercut hurt KSI pretty badly. Uh, and it looks like had he engaged more, maybe he could have got the stoppage. Again, I, I don't know. It's – it's uh, yeah, there's a lot of conjecture there. Anyways, I will also say that – I whatever regardless of what somebody may feel about this fight and these guys collecting a big amount of money i'll say that i got to give them some respect in in the in the regard that a lot of people will talk shit about them and say you know look these these two youtubers look how much they're making it's a slap in the face but you have to give them credit to it to my mind you have to give them credit because they had the balls to actually step into a ring uh, because there are a lot of people who don't have the, they, they don't have the balls to do that, and these two did. I mean, at at least to a degree, they walked the walk. They just didn't talk talk tough on YouTube videos and not do anything. They they did actually fight. So I, I got to give them that much. And I, I don't mind if Eddie Hearn or somebody else who wants to be business savvy if they put stuff like this on their undercards or, or make use of it even more. I mean, I, I don't really mind it, honestly. I mean, whatever they, you know, if it maximizes uh, earnings, you know, if it helps revenue, uh, you know, if you think you're getting enough crossover fans from it and you actually put on a good undercard, I'm not bothered by it. Anyways, we'll move on to the next topic. Um, well, I, d- I did want to talk about Canelo and his pound for pound stature and, you know, pound for pound is always an interesting debate because some people have different criteria than others. Uh, and personally, I don't really get up in arms about anybody who sa- who has a differing opinion. I mean, cause there's a lot, there's a lot of ways to see this. You know, I know plenty of people who have, uh, um, 
Terrence Crawford at number one, and their reasoning is that he looks the best. They think he has the best skills. Uh, you also have Lomachenko, who doesn't quite—he doesn't have the resume of Canelo, but he, lo- you know, some people think he's the most skilled. So it's kind of one of those things where Lomachenko may be the most skilled, but his resume is better than Crawford's. Canelo probably has the best resume but he might be the least skilled of these guys. And some people say, hey, now you were anyway, if he were the same size as these guys, he'd mess him up. Some people say, hey, cruiserweight was un- underrated. Usyk is my top guy. Again, I don't have a big problem no matter how you how you make this up, so long as there's some sort of justifiable rationale behind it. Um, but what do you think about Canelo being pound for pound number one? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and I would have Canelo number one as well. On the transnational board, I voted for him to be number one. And the reasoning is this. I mean, a lot of people don't like Canelo Alvarez. And again, I'm not a big fan either. I'm I'm really not. Listen, anybody who's listened to the show for an extended period of time knows that I, I you know, I like Golovkin. You know, he's he's my guy. I think he was gypped a little bit. Uh, but you it's just the sheer weight of his resume 
is just it's it, at this juncture it's so in your face compared to other people's that i think it's hard to deny them i mean i mean even and here's the thing too is you know you talk about the asterisks uh, but i don't i don't see them as being as bad as like uh you know some of the things that mayweather did for instance i mean he's not draining guys you know he's not saying hey we're not like with with sergey kovalev for instance he didn't say we're not fighting at 175 we're fighting at 173 uh you know and he did have the rehydration clause but i didn't put much emphasis on that because i think he said you could only weigh 150 or 185 and they weighed in for the rehydration clause, from what I've heard, at 10 a.m. the night of the fight. And so when you really put that into perspective, and again, maybe I've got my facts wrong. Maybe I'm just I'm going off what I heard. You know, I'm not an insider. I'm not rubbing elbows with any of these guys. So it's just what I've heard. Um, you know, they weighed in at 10 a.m. the night of the fight. Uh, you know, and by the time that fight finally got started, I don't think it mattered much at all. Um, but it's just... When you just look at the sheer weight of it, here's the thing too is here's how I look at it. So the Golovkin fight, it seems like an overwhelming majority of, of you know, educated fans had Golovkin winning that fight. Here Here's my, my reasoning though, is that even if you think that Alvarez is, uh, oh, you know, maybe oh, and two against Golovkin, even lost to Laura, though. I don't think the Laura fight should factor in a pound for pound discussion. I mean, that was what, you know, five years ago, something like that, six years ago. I think it was, I think it was 2015, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's a little far, far to go back for, you know, pound for pound discussion. But when you, when you look at the Golovkin fights, even if you think he lost the first Golovkin fight, for instance, and then you, had you know you were like well I scored it for Golovkin but it can go either way what how I look at thing is if the decision is close and it was reasonable enough uh, I think you have to honor the decision and I see you know even for the people who scored it for Golovkin in the rematch I don't think you can def- definitively definitively say hey Golovkin clearly won that fight uh, again, there are a lot of people who had it either way. A lot of people added a draw. So, t- <clears throat> yeah, uh, yeah, I think he clearly won the first. F- I think he clearly won it, but it was also one of those fights where it, it, it was to me it was clear, but it wasn't. It wasn't cl- it, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's my thing is even if you think he lost to Golovkin, who was also a pound for pounder by the time. And I think that's worth noting is Canelo is the only guy fighting other guys in the pound for pound. Yeah. Maybe Golovkin's faded. However you want to slice it, he is still a pound for pound guy. And so he's the only guy fighting pound for pounder. So even if you had him losing the first fight, if you had Alvarez winning the second fight or Golovkin winning, but uh, you know, it was close enough. I think you have to honor you know these decisions even if even if they're close yeah i uh, yeah i agree Yeah, he was too reserved.
Yeah, I agree. No, it's not a robbery. Not, none of, I don't, I don't think, I don't think you could classify any of them really as a robbery. Maybe, again, the only I'm trying to insert some context in this, but maybe the first, you know, Alvarez glove can fight if you want. I mean, because you cannot justify Adelaide Bird cards. I mean, that that's just. You're, I don't know what you're doing when you're scoring at ten to two, and and that's that's what I think rubs so many people the wrong way. Is if it would have been seven to five, uh, you know, something like that, I think less people would be suspicious about that. But what it has done is it's been a continuation of horrible scorecards in Canelo Alvarez's favor. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of people hate him. I, I, again, I understand why he feels like a cog in the political machine, right? I mean, it, I even wrote an article about this. I mean, the, 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 the bullshit scorecards go way back. And I, I'm talking about before, you know, Alvarez, I mean, uh, you know, go watch the Larry Mosley fight and he, you know, he's getting, what was it? Nine to one against Larry Mosley. And I thought, I thought Larry Mosley was pretty competitive and uh, I cited a sweet science. Uh, I think it was a ringside write-up, and they were like, "Yeah, it was a competitive fight." I I think they scored it like I can't even remember. It was a while ago, but six to four or something for Alvarez. Mosley was pretty good, um, but yeah, what 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 was it? Uh, Austin Trout. There was a ten to two card. Uh, Laura, I think. Yeah, uh, Co- yeah, Cotto was eleven to one. Uh, Laura, I think it was uh, what nine to three. I think there was I think there was a 93 card in there and then Adelaide Bird 10 to 2 and then of course the probably the worst of all uh, that's probably the worst of all the uh the 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 draw for the Mayweather fight Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm actually, yeah, I'm looking at it right now and Austin trout in the Austin trout fight. And again, I, I will, I gotta, I gotta note that there are some smart people who I know, like cliff rolled, for instance, who's a hardcore boxing fan, knows a ton about the game, uh, has been doing it a long time. He actually scored it for Austin trout. And I don't think that's unreasonable. I had it for Alvarez, but there was actually a 10 to two card in the Austin trout, uh, Alvarez fight, uh, yeah, I, I, I just, I don't get that one. Yeah, he was. Well, yeah, and and this is all back to what we're saying about Canelo and the you know the asterisks. I mean, this this is why a lot of people are hesitant to put him you know pound for pound number one, give him the credit. And again, it's not as if there's not substance behind this. I mean, even when you subtract all the political cards. I mean, you look at the Clem Buterall thing and, uh, you know, maybe you heard the show with John and I and, 
you know, technically the amount that was in Canelo's system is, you know, that could be attributed to uh, contaminated meat. Uh, I'm obviously a bit, uh, I fall on the skeptical side of that. You know, I think you should know what you're putting in your body. And it just seems like it, even Douglas Fisher, um, I think this was after Francisco Vargas got caught for, uh, you know, Clint Buterall. Um, you know, Douglas Fisher in his uh, Monday mailbag said, and this, this was before the Alvarez thing came to light. He was like, hey, these Mexican guys got to stop using it as an excuse. They should be aware of what's in their body. And, and again, there are cases, you know, want to increase the levels. And, and there's all sorts of other stuff. But here's the thing is, if if Canelo did use performance enhancing drugs, uh, you know, and people are like, oh, well, he was tested for the Golovkin rematch. Well, yes, but if you use PEDs, there is evidence to suggest that it may have lifelong effects, right? Your body may adjust to that, and that's just the norm from then on out. And again, so I, I know a lot of people who are very skeptical of what he's been doing, don't want to give him too much credit. But I think even when you take away some of the some of the things that have been happening that seem a bit shady, I still think he's just he's I mean, Daniel Jacobs fight, for instance. I mean, Daniel Jacobs was you know, the, the third best middleweight in the world behind him and Golovkin. And he won, he won pretty clearly. I mean, he didn't really, there were no real inhibitors in that one. I mean, he beat Kovlev. Yeah, maybe Kovlev's old. He's not what he used to be, but he still beat a top five light heavyweight. Also, how many other guys at middleweight are going to replicate those results? So I, again, I think just because of the sheer weight of his resume, he deserves to be number one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think Canelo's one of those guys. I think Canelo gives himself too much credit. <laughs> Well, can, can you can you elaborate on that a bit? Because I I think I follow Gabriel Montoya, but Montoya, but he's I think he's been one of those uh, writers who's been pretty isolated. I don't think a lot of guys get along with him, so I, I don't see much of his stuff. But I know he's been one of those guys who who's been on the PED thing. He's he's been one of those guys who's more keen to that than a lot of others.
Well, yeah, maybe. Well, if you if you look at the guys who have done it recently, I mean, <clears throat> if you just use examples of middleweights in in recent years who have done who have done similar things, James Tony moved from one sixty to one seventy five. Uh, Roy Jones did it, uh, but Tony actually Tony. Yeah, Tony was caught, but the the funny thing about it was Freddie Roach had said that he knew when James Tony was on it because he looked bulkier, but you could see that t- Tony didn't look and of course I I always you know give a uh you know a note to this too because even if you don't look like you're using that really doesn't matter much. Uh, I mean, because they're perfor- they're performance enhancing drugs. A lot of people who are unfamiliar with the topic have a tendency to associate performance enhancing drug with steroids and steroids with bulking up and their performance enhancing drugs for all sorts of different things. You know, if you need better stamina, if you need to recuperate faster so you can train harder, there are a lot of drugs that, I mean, some of the stuff that I've heard that's going on now is pretty incredible. Uh, I've heard that there's uh, uh, there's dissolvable tablets, like dissolvable HGH tablets. Uh, you, you you just stick them in your mouth and drink a glass of water, and and there you go. Uh, I remember Shane Mosley used to use something called the cream. You'd rub it on your body. You'd be out of your out of your system in four hours. Uh, Melvin Perez, who is a uh, uh, you know an often contributor to my Casual Mondays article, he uh, he just. Uh, pointed to pointing me to something that's called gene doping, which I plan on looking into. But the thing about it is, is this too is, and I think you've heard me say this is, <clears throat> Vada is a good organization. They're doing better than everybody else, but you cannot bank on them being ahead of the people who are cheating. It's just not the case, man. Uh, the the people who are cheating are always ahead of the people who are trying to catch them because there's not enough money invested in catching these people. The money is for the cheaters. That's why, I mean, the, the Olympics is not going to be as exciting if you don't have people breaking records. And so if you if, if you make sure that, you know, Usain Bolt and all these other guys are being, you know, 24, 24-7 drug tested all the time, they're just not going to run as fast times. I mean, all of a sudden you're going to have guys – You know, instead of running, you know, nine fives in a sprint, you're going to have Usain Bolt running low tens. I mean, that's that's just all there is to it. And that's just not that's not going to bring in the revenue that breaking records does. Well, well, yeah, and, and you bring up Memor Heredia, who is a guy who's still, you know, patrolling boxing gyms to this day, and he was actually in a documentary, a German documentary about PEDs, and and you can catch a clip on YouTube. Uh, just just type in Memor Heredia. What is it? Um, 
ah, damn it, I can't remember what it is, but just type in documentary. Maybe that'll bring it up. Uh, I know I published, I posted this at somebody else's page not long ago, but Heredia shows you how easy it is in Mexico. To, you can walk into a pharmacy, say, hey, can I get some EPO? Sure, no problem. I mean, w- within minutes you get it. But Heredia is an interesting guy to bring up, partly because he was part of the Balco scandal, but he has said, I've, I've read interviews with him, and he seems to enjoy this sort of stuff. That's why I don't, you know, he, he, you can't trust the guy. Anybody that, that he's working with, I am convinced that they're they're doping. Um, but he said that, uh, I think this, this was years back too, but he said, whenever the Olympics finds a way to, to catch a certain drug, all he said, all he has to do is alter its chemistry slightly, and then he has a new drug, and you know, then they have to wait until they catch that. He, I mean, he made it sound like he had, you know, twenty other drugs on his shelf, waiting in line. So, the, you know, whenever the one he's using gets gets uh, found out, he just goes to the shelf and, and and uses a new one. And another thing too is he actually he actually did a. Uh, he was kind of tight with the Germans during, uh, what was it, the 2007 Olympics, I believe. He did an interview with uh, uh, a newspaper. I'm trying to remember which one it was. But it, it was a, it was an insightful interview. And he was talking about And this was when Usain Bolt, I don't know if it was his first Olympics. I, I believe it was his first Olympics. Um, but he straight up said, e- every sprinter is on PDs, every single one of them. He said, you cannot run those times naturally there's just there's no possible way and I, i'm i'm 100% convinced that bolt did do peds I, I i don't follow sprinting that closely but i'm 100% convinced that he that he did do them i mean you just don't break every single guy like in the top 20 has been caught using peds and all of a sudden usain bolt comes around and not only that he runs like a 10.07 or something like that uh, in two, in 2007. And then in 2008 Olympics, he's running, you know, sub nine, seven or something like that. It, it, it just doesn't make sense. And not only that, there's a lot of stuff to get into there. And I, I don't want to take this down, you know, a big rabbit hole. Cause it's, it's not quite to what we're trying to get at here, but, uh, they've, they found that, uh, you know, back in the two, I think it was two thousand. I think it was the two thousand eight Olympics. Uh, they found that the the headquarters for the drug testing agency, what when they investigated, it was like a janitor's closet in some some gym or something. I mean, it's it's. I mean, and, and that's that's part of the conflict of interest too, is because WADA it only has an annual budget of about twenty million dollars. You're leaving countries to try and catch their own people. And in that you have a conflict of interest, you know, why would Jamaica want to catch Usain Bolt with the increased tourism revenue, all the sponsorship deals he's getting? I think they gave him like a $2 million house. Uh, I, I mean, again, it's it's all about money. Not only that, it's, it's not only about money, but, uh, you know, it's about politics as well because, you know, a lot of countries are trying to make a statement during the Olympics, you know, and, and it's politics. Anyways, Canelo Alvarez again. I I don't I don't know. It's it's always tough to say when you say yeah. I'm convinced the guy is using, uh, but it is one of those things where he did do the the Vada drug testing for yeah yeah sure.
Wouldn't, wouldn't be the first time. Yeah, uh, again, if uh, Memo Heredia is saying it, uh, th- that's just about good enough for me. But my my thing is, I think pretty much, I think the vast majority of these guys are doing it at the top level. I, I just don't think the testing is good enough to catch most guys. And it, it is not, it is, it is the right way to approach it. You know, the presumption of innocent pr- to, until proven guilty. But it's also the thing for me is that. There's just so the system is designed for people to cheat. It's not designed for them to be clean because your the chances of you getting caught are astronomically low. I mean, and, and when you take into account, you know, all the other all the other failings. I mean, if, if, since you seem to follow Victor Conti, you know some of the stuff he says. He's exposed the you know the drug testing in the Olympics as as being shoddy, and you know now in any way, even even when they've made improvements, you know they're they're currently doing the uh, the biological passport. Um, it's worth. I don't know if you've seen the documentary Icarus, but it's worth checking out. The the guy who did Icarus, he did a podcast with Joe Rogan, very good podcast, and, and it's one of those eye opening ones too. Uh, well, yeah, but yeah, no, no. So it so Icarus is about a guy who what he what he planned on doing was he planned on seeing how well he did on PEDs as a bicyclist. And as he was in the process of doing so, he got caught up with a Russian scientist who was at the head of Rusada, and it snowballed into this big state-sponsored doping program with Russia. Incredible stuff. But the, the, the podcast with Joe Rogan, in my opinion, is just as good and really highlights all of, all of the failings in drug testing altogether. I mean, even this biological passport stuff that they do, it sounds fancy. You you know, they keep track of everything that's going on. It's just, they have to maintain a level of innocence so high that they know they're working with cheaters, but they have to make sure that there's no possible excuse for that result to be the way it is, right? So the only possible way is for it to be that they're cheating before they can accuse a guy or else they'll get sued. And again, with a $20 million annual budget, they could go underwater real quick, especially with some of these multi-million dollar athletes. Anyways, I think Nonito Donaire is a good example of what a clean athlete looks like. When you look at him, he started off at, what, 112, and he's gotten flabbier, right? He to me, Donaire is is I think the first and the only the second guy to ever do three sixty five Vada testing for, I think like their entire career, most of their career. I think Edwin Rodriguez, uh, I think the super middleweight did it as well. But Donaire strikes me as a guy who is clean because as he's gro- gone up in size, he's gotten flabbier, he's gotten slower, his punching power has not been quite as good. And with uh, Canelo moving up to 175, looking, you know, looking tight, yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, it's it's worth speculating. I, again, it's just it's just tough to tell. But I, I want to talk to you about Inua, in, Inua real quick because uh, you said that Inua should not be number one, and I agree with that uh, position. Um, and, and there was some debate with Transnational about moving Inua up, and I disagreed. I, like, I couldn't see him being above Lomachenko or uh, Canelo Alvarez. And, and, and my reason is this. If you're, if the best guy on your resume is a near 37-year-old Nonito Donaire uh, who looked good, I mean, I, I acknowledge that. He did look good. But this is also a guy who, again, is almost 37 years old. He's losing to guys like Jesse Mag- Magdaleno. He really hasn't had an uncontroversial win over a top 10 guy in about six years, if I'm not mistaken. I think 2012 was the last time he had a really good win over a top 10 guy. 
Uh, it to me, it's just not enough to get him over the hump and into the elite. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and that's what, that's one of my things too. Is I'm not going to talk like an expert on this topic, but it was disappointing to see uh, Inua kind of jump over divisions. I think he passed over 112, where he only stayed there temporarily. Donny Nietes was there. Uh, Kazuto Ioka, who I think is damn good. I, actually, you could argue that Ioka is a better fighter than Nietes. Uh, Nietes was the flyweight champ, if I'm not mistaken. I know he was the ring champ, and I'm not sure if he was lineal. Um, but Ioka, in my opinion, and I think in most scorecards, Ioka beat Nietes when they fought. He just stopped the guy who had a, a, a bad draw against Nietes. So Ioka, I would have liked to have seen. He was a Japanese guy. Um, yeah, we, we didn't get Rung Vasai, We didn't get Gonzalez. And, and again, I, I don't know exactly what happened there, whether there was any negotiations made or anything, but I feel as if it had any other guy done that, right? If, if Lomachenko had done that, had skipped over weight classes and missed these guys. I mean, you know, Nietes is one of the better Filipino fighters to ever do it. I mean, I, I'm not exactly sure he's a legend. He's not a legend in my mind, but you know, he's a Filipino legend, but I feel like if Crawford or, you, you know, some of these other guys had missed that level of talent, I feel like they'd be getting a lot more shit for it. Uh, but my thing is, my thing is this, is you look at some of the guys that he beat, and some of them were certainly good. Uh, you know, Narv Narvaez was highly ranked, though I never thought that, I never thought that much of him because he actually fought Donaire years before and was just real pedestrian in that effort. Didn't even look like he, he just fought to survive, basically. Um, you know, I, I think he beat... <clears throat> <clears> Thank <throat> you. 
I agree. I, I just don't. I don't think if Donaire is your best win again, Ryan Burnett was beating Donaire. Again, you, you might be right that this was a Klitschko s performance. I just I. I, I'm just not convinced of guys like Jamie McDonald and and you know Narvaez. I mean, to me, these even Donaire, he's not an elite level operator. Uh, I, I think I think Lomachenko's resume is significantly better than any was. I mean, how would you compare a 36 year old Donaire to uh, you know Nicholas Walters? I mean, Walters was the number one guy at 126. Uh, what about an old Donaire versus Gary Russell Jr. or I? Well, yeah, and the thing about Rigondeaux, too, is it, you're you're right. You had brought this up earlier. There was a big size difference. But I don't think – and Rigondeaux was actually a pound-for-pounder. And it was still – he's still the 122-pound champion. I know a lot of people uh, forget that because, uh, you know, he's pretty much been off the radar since Lomachenko made him quit. But he was a pound-for-pounder still to some – uh, you know, the weight difference was obviously too much. Lomachenko was significantly bigger. But to me, that performance didn't strike me as a, a big versus small one. It, it, to me, it looked like Lomachenko was just the better skilled guy. And Rigondeaux whooped Nonito Donator's ass. Again, I know I'm not going to give... I'm not going to give him full credit for that. I mean, even Lomachenko doesn't give himself full credit for that. But I, I'm just looking at it. And I'm like, well, how do you really compare Gary Russell Jr. to, you know, this old Donair or, you know, Walter to this old Donair? Even Campbell, who I think deserves more credit. I mean, Campbell fought Linares very closely when Linares was the number one lightweight in the world. And then, you know, he just fought Lomachenko competitively as well. Lomachenko is the number one lightweight in the world. So to me, to me, I just, I don't think anyone has done enough. He's not convinced me that he's even the best bantamweight in the world. Cause I, I think you, you brought up, you brought up this point just a, a minute ago that in you, uh, it, you, you know, it's, it's it, what his performance as answered some questions, but it's also asked some questions. Some guys were really high on him and they were like, Hey, he'll move up to 126 and blow guys away. I'm not convinced. Like I, I'm not. I'm just. I'm not convinced personally that he's just. He's. He's going to blow featherweights away. I'm not even sure. Right. The the Lewis Neary fight actually looks a bit closer now. Right. I agree. Yeah, he he's 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 like three to four on a lot of people's lists now because it and it's because of his recent opposition. That's a that's a you're talking crazy now.
Rick and Dale. I agree. Yeah, well, yeah, he 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 took a, a good number of punches in his last fight. Yeah, and so I, I do wonder about Rick and Dale right now. He's clearly not, you know, in in his prime. He's he's he, many years past his prime, really. Uh, but he's still obviously a high level operator, but he, he just, he wasn't moving as much in his last fight. It was more of a slug fest than I'd ever seen him. So I wonder, you know, is with as much as he was getting hit, is that just one of those things he was doing for the fans or is that, you know, a sign of things to come? I have uh, a feeling that it's a sign of things to come. And I do think anyone would, would probably blow him away, but I think if it's not right, if he can still move his feet, somewhat like he used to be. I do think that would be an interesting fight. I'd really like to see it. But my, I, I would like to see him at least against Neri or Tate. And, and this, it depends on who the number two guy is, in my opinion, because, uh, you know, I like that Inyo was fighting in a traditional vision, a division of Bantamweight. Uh, we have Lewis Neri and Tate fighting soon. Depending on their respective performances, you know, either one of those guys could be number two. But I'd like to see... Again, depending on their performances, I'd like to see him the best of that bunch. If Estrada, if Estrada can move up three pounds, I'd love to see that. And if Rigondeaux can be done soon, you know, because time is of the essence with him, I'd really like to see it. But that's my point with Inua altogether is that I'm not convinced yet that he's the very best bantamweight in the world. So how the hell can he be the best fighter in the world? And I, I rate him closer to Estrada personally because to me, Estrada's fighting the stronger opposition. I mean, he. I I no I I do th- so. This is how I look at it. He is the number one guy, but I'm not convinced that he's the very best. Uh, so he's number one, but is he the champion? He's not until he beats the best guys there. I'm I'm not sure. Right. It, that's that. That's how I look at it is, is like a lot of people like with Terrence Crawford, you know, there are people who are like, well, he looks the best. And my line is always this looking and being are, are can be different things. Anyone anyway looks he, he looked like a destroyer before anyway, and he still looks very good. And I like what I saw out of the Donair performance. I mean, he, he was tough. He didn't panic. He boxed nicely. He stuck behind the jab. There was a lot to really like there. And I think, I do think he is the best bantamweight in the world. I think that, but I need to be convinced of that. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. And I, I do have to note that it, when you look historically um, at the pound for pound landscape, uh, there aren't very many bantamweights who get to the number one position, at least not solidly. So it it, it is going to be a bit of an upward qu- climb for Inua. Uh, again, I I like the guy a lot. I really do. It's just when people start investing too much in one guy and they're like, you know, he's a destroyer. He's a legend already. It, boxing is one. It's really one of those games where you need to you you, you need to answer the questions before we we give you a crown. Anyways, sure. Right. Yeah. And so if let's imagine that Lomachenko beats uh, Teofimo Lopez for all, you know, let's imagine that whoever wins Comey Lopez is the number two guy at lightweight and Lomachenko beats him. You know, some people are going to say, hey, he's not the undisputed champion. And let's imagine that fight comes off before Devin Haney fights Javier Fortuna. I mean, it just seems absurd that in a game like this, Lomachenko would have to beat a guy whose best win is Zaur Abdelayev or Santiago to be considered the undisputed champion. Again, it doesn't make any sense. And the problem with boxing is when you don't have a governing body and there's no regulation and you have these alphabet super organizations who can do whatever they like, you're going to get this stuff. And in regard to the weight class, all I'll say is this. My solution would be to have real hard data, do a scientific study, figure out the data, figure out what the best weight, how many, figure out how many weight classes realistically you should have and what the weight between them should be and go with that. Uh, Yeah, there's 17. I, 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 well, I think 17 is way, 14 is way too many too, but that's why I say defer it to the experts, let them figure it out and let's go with that. Let the experts deal with that. And then we'll follow along with that. That way we can get our safety. That way the problem I think would be resolved instead of, you know, like, oh, well, we should have eight or we should. Again, I I think we should just leave that for the experts and let them handle that. Anyways, do you have anything else to say as your final word or you want to wrap it up?
Yeah, yeah, it's always good. It's always good to talk. I, I hope I've been a gracious host. But uh, yeah, I mean, we we can get you on next week. We can get your word on Ortiz Wilder rematch. I know there's going to be a lot of hype surrounding that. A lot of people are going to be talking about it, and I'm interested to see, hear what people say. I mean, it seems like the the narrative right now is that Wilder's going to stop him earlier. Anyways, we'll get your opinion on that next week. I appreciate you coming on. As always, we are brought to you by betnow.eu. Click on the banner. Use Truth50 as your promo code. Uh, You get a little something back for your betting needs. Uh, The Retired Boxers Foundation with Jackie Richardson and Alex Ramos, who are providing for fighters who do not have 401k plans. This is a tough game. If you can go there, pitch in. It'd be greatly appreciated. And Seat Giant, if you need tickets for a boxing match, again, click the banner. We get a little kickback. So as always, I'm your host for tonight, Jeremiah Pricer. With me is Hamed. Have a good night.